Ahora sí, muy buenos días a todas y todos. En nombre de la Fundación Educacional Seminarium y el Centro de Innovación del Ministerio de Educación en Chile, queremos darle una cordial bienvenida a una nueva charla online a un clic, que estos espacios básicamente tienen como objetivo acercar a la comunidad escolar latinoamericana, eh, a las y los especialistas que van a la vanguardia en la innovación en educación de absolutamente todo el mundo. Así que esperamos que más de alguno de ustedes se haya podido sumar en instancias eh, anteriores y si no lo han hecho, ya están invitadas e invitados a seguir participando de estos espacios que lo hacemos con tanto cariño. Eh, en este contexto, hoy vamos a estar junto a Daniel Wilson. Él es director de Project Zero e investigador principal también del mismo centro. Es profesor de la Universidad de Harvard Graduate School of Education, de la Universidad de Harvard, y presidente educativo del Instituto Ambientes de Aprendizaje para el Mañana de la misma Casa de Estudios. Adicionalmente, dirige el proyecto Leading Learning That Matters, una colaboración de varios años con 25 escuelas independientes en Victoria, Australia, y que tiene como objetivo documentar las prácticas de aprendizaje y liderazgo del siglo XXI. Así que, desde ya, y bueno, hay un enorme currículum eh, adicional que tiene Daniel Wilson, quien nos acompaña. Así que desde ya queremos agradecerle el haberse dado este tiempo de estar eh, junto a nosotros en esta charla online. Pero ya vamos a ir con él, porque antes quiero invitar y darle la palabra más bien a Martín Cáceres, él es director del Centro de Innovación del Ministerio de Educación aquí en Chile, una de las organizaciones que yo ya les decía, hicieron posible que este espacio eh, se diera y estar todas y todos juntos aquí. Así que eh, Martín, muy bienvenido, muchas gracias, un saludo también al Centro de Innovación y adelante con tus palabras. Hola, muchas gracias Edmundo, gracias a la Fundación eh, Seminario por, por la invitación, eh, por la organización del evento, eh, y muchas gracias a, a las y los profesores que, que están aquí, eh, gracias, gracias a Daniel eh, por darse el, el tiempo. Ahora, quería compartir con ustedes muy, muy brevemente eh, una introducción, eh, ¿Por qué es importante para nosotros como ministerio participar en, en esta instancia y en este tipo de instancias? Sabemos que estamos en un momento eh, muy difícil para las comunidades educativas, ¿cierto? Después de, de los casi dos años de, de interrupción de las clases presenciales, eh, estamos viviendo un, un, un momento bien, bien complejo, eh, enfrentando el, el tema de las relaciones, ¿cierto?, la, eh, la crisis socioemocional eh, que están viviendo nuestros estudiantes, la sobrecarga que tienen lo, los y las docentes, ¿cierto? Estamos enfrentando eh, tremendas brechas en el aprendizaje. O sea, los dos años de, de clases online eh, fueron súper fueron difíciles de, de abordar. Eh, y el primer semestre también fue, fue complicado. Eh, entonces, ahora, en este momento tenemos la pregunta de cómo abordar eh, el tema socioemocional y el tema de las brechas en el aprendizaje. Eh, y bueno, podríamos hacer distintas cosas, eh, porque tenemos este currículum, cierto, que sabemos que es bien extenso, tenemos un montón de objetivos de aprendizaje, eh, de todas las asignaturas, entonces, ¿cómo lo abordamos? Una alternativa podría ser volvernos locos e eh, intentar apresuradamente pasar toda la materia. Toda esa materia que no vi durante dos años, eh, pasarla eh, desde un enfoque muy tradicional, eh, en el fondo enfocarse en pasar el, todos los contenidos. Eh, yo creo, eh, como y como ministerio, eh, creemos que esa no es la opción que hay que seguir, sino que tenemos que ver cuáles son las, las metodologías de aprendizaje que apuntan a la profundidad y al aprendizaje integral, o sea, ver cuáles son esos aprendizajes centrales, eh, qué es lo más importante, en el fondo ir a la profundidad en vez de a la extensión. Y ahí justamente la, la metodología del aprendizaje, del pensamiento visible, todo lo que, lo que nos va a hablar Daniel con, con más profundidad, eh, es súper interesante porque apuntan juntame, justamente al aprendizaje integral, o sea, entregan herramientas concretas para 
identificar el desarrollo de la comprensión, el desarrollo de habilidades centrales y bien profundas, eh, y retroalimentar a los estudiantes en el avance. O sea, son herramientas bien eh, aplicables a la sala de clases y súper contingentes para el momento actual. Eh, y se enmarca súper bien en las acciones que estamos implementando como ministerio. Entonces les quería contar que estamos llevando a cabo la política de reactivación integral, seamos comunidad, donde tenemos un montón de medidas, orientaciones y estamos disponibilizando también recursos para quitar presión y entregar más apoyo a las comunidades educativas en esta misma dirección, para un aprendizaje integral y de calidad. Así que muy contento de, de, de poder participar en esto y, y muy atento a la exposición de, de Daniel. Y muchas gracias a los docentes por estar preocupados de, 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 de estas cosas, de cómo avanzar hacia un aprendizaje más integral. Así que mucho, mucho ánimo y aguante a los y las profesoras. Gracias Martín, totalmente. ¿eh? Es, es, un, es un momento súper complejo para las escuelas. Eh, pero estamos seguros que las y los docentes, no solo las que nos acompañan, sino que también quienes se inscribieron y quienes nos han estado acompañando a lo largo de, de esta serie de actividades que, que, que desarrollamos conjuntamente, eh, la verdad que van a poder y han podido, por lo demás, hacer frente a estos enormes desafíos. Eh, así que muchas gracias por, por tus palabras, muchas gracias por los proyectos que están desarrollando eh, también como ministerio, justamente en la línea de seguir aportando y apoyando a las comunidades escolares eh, eh, chilenas en particular. Y nosotros vamos a seguir también trabajando en conjunto, espero, eh, para efecto justamente eh, de lo mismo. Quiero saludar además a las personas que nos acompañan. Mira, estuve viendo que hay personas eh, que creo que vi San Vicente, desde Perú también, desde Frutillar, ahí la, la Carolina Beche, un saludo Carolina, muchas gracias. Eh, desde El Espejo, aquí en Santiago... Eh, también desde Argentina, Gabriela Gariboto, mucha, muchos saludos allá, Talagante también, Santiago, etc. Así que muchas gracias a todas y todos quienes nos acompañan, eh, aprovechen ese chat porque vamos a estar haciendo muchas preguntas o las, las y los invitamos a hacer preguntas a través eh, de, ese, de ese chat. Así que eso, ahora sí, quiero dar la palabra a Daniel Wilson, director de proyección de la Universidad de Harvard, y quien además, quiero darles el dato, va a estar acompañándonos, eh, o va a estar presente durante el noveno Congreso Internacional de Educación que estamos organizando nosotros como Fundación Educacional Seminarium los días 23 y 24 de agosto. Así que quienes quieran conocer más detalles sobre este evento pueden ingresar a www.fundacionseminarium.com justamente para ver quiénes también nos, va a, nos van a estar acompañando. Por lo demás, aprovecho de saludar nuevamente a la Isabel Baeza, que va a ser una de nuestras relatoras ese día, o uno de esos días, y que también nos está acompañando el día de hoy. Así que, desde ya, todas y todos invitados al noveno Congreso Internacional de Educación, en, en el cual Daniel también va a estar presente. Y quienes tengan consultas, reitero, pueden empezar a enviarlas a través del chat para que al término de la presentación de Daniel podamos leerlas y responder lo más posible. Dicho lo anterior... Damos la palabra a Daniel Wilson. Muchas gracias nuevamente por acompañarnos. Ay, gracias, todo el mundo, y gracias el seminario y Martín en el ministerio. Y um, de verdad, yo puedo hablar un poquito en español, pero yo voy a dar esta charla en inglés. Entonces, yo voy a empezar a cambiar mi idioma. Um, cuando, cambie, cuando cambie tu idioma, Daniel, quiero contarle a la gente que se incorporó el botón de interpretación y pueden seleccionar ahí el canal de español para que escuchen con traducción simultánea. Ahí está bajito, interpretación, y si no, los tres puntitos. Así que ahí lo pueden encontrar. Gracias, Daniel. Always good advice, Edmundo. Thank you. <laughs> um, it is a pleasure to be here, and I'm, I want to also join Martín and thank the teachers and, and leaders, not only for all the courageous work that you continue to do, but for specifically taking the time today. Life is busy. You probably are taking time away from colleagues, uh, students, families, and um, I appreciate you taking that time to be curious and to learn about some ideas. And um, the invitation for me today was to set the stage uh, for a talk that I'll be delivering in several weeks around visible learning. And so what I'd like to do with your permission is to spend about 30 minutes and lay a foundation uh, for what I hope will be um, a practical and hopefully useful set of ideas that we can pick up on in uh, a few weeks. 
And those ideas are visible learning, invisible thinking pedagogies. But for this talk, what I'd like to do is center us on, you know, why visible learning, why visible thinking are so important. And as we as ed educators and leaders, as we, in a way, explore the possibilities for what education can be for our learners. What are some of the critical concepts that form that foundation for us? And I think this is crucial because, as Martine said, you know, the last few years have been really difficult. I mean, I don't pretend to know the kinds of loss some of us have endured, whether it's loss of normalcy and routine, a loss of connection with colleagues and learners, loss of loved ones. Now, there's a deep sense of loss. And in those kinds of difficulties, as we do our jobs of organizing developmental experiences, interesting things emerged over the last two years. We should not discount that interesting things emerged. But we were also, as educators, just doing our damn best really trying to do our best in a very difficult circumstance. One of the things that many of us have come to realize is that the pandemic caused a conversation around what is the role of school. And let's assume for the moment that one of the primary roles of schools is learning. Now, I hope we don't need to debate that point. But in this talk, what I'd like to do is invite us to revisit the fundamental goal of schooling as learning. And if that's the case, before we leap to you know, innovations and changes, let us consider what are those innovations and changes seeking to serve? Is it learning or something else? And if it's something else, we should be very critical of the new kinds of designs of structures. So I'm going to share my screen. Can you see that? Just give me a thumbs up if you can see. Yes, thumbs up. Thank you. Thank you. And the title of this opening talk is called Transformations. And learning. And what I'd like to do in this talk is to acquaint us with some of the big, say, innovations that have happened recently over the last few decades and historically over the last century. And I want to remind us as educators that these kinds of transformations are critical to understand because many of the innovations or things that we've seen you know, recently or even in the last decade or so, tend to recycle outdated models of learning. And, you know, if we look at the images on the right, there are lots of interesting things that emerged over the pandemic, whether it be more outdoor and environmental education, because students needed to have the air quality, whether it be digital and immersive environments that students could be learning in, we're all probably too familiar with Zoom, but these, you know, online environments and other kinds of community experiences where students were out in the world doing things during the pandemic. So a lot of interesting things happened, but we should ask ourselves, how do they speak to learning? And how can learning be, in a way, a light that guides us? as we're considering innovations and transformations in our practice and in our school, in our state or in our country. So I'd like to begin this talk by inviting you to go back in time and imagine the year is 1899. And in 1899, the World's Fair was being held in Paris, France. And the organizers of the World's Fair 
invited an artist named Jean-Marc Cote to render a number of slightly whimsical images of what the world would look like in the year 2000. And so imagine, if you will, you can Google these images, pictures of, say, what hospitals and healthcare would look like, pictures of what the mail delivery service would look like. And Jean-Marc Cote rendered an image of what schools would look like in the year 2000. Now, I'm going to show you this image, but what I'd like to ask you is, what is the belief about learning that was guiding Jean-Marc Cote's picture? In other words, what does learning mean in this picture? So take a few seconds, kind of glance around at this image. And in the chat, write a few words about what do you notice in this picture that suggests what does learning mean? So students. Focuses on books, yes. You see that this old white man putting books in this kind of machine, reproducing content. Automated, yeah, transmission. Right, Where students are just passively receiving knowledge. What else do we notice here? So socialization, yeah, they're all kind of individual and not interacting, the speed of learning. And they don't seem to be active at all. I always wonder what this boy over here in the far left is thinking. He seems to be looking at everyone else saying like, what are you doing? I like to think he's thinking that. And I always wonder what did this boy do that, to get this job? He must have done something terrible if this is what he's doing. Excellent. Lots of things that we can notice here. And look, we can kind of laugh at this image. I mean, obviously schools don't look like this in, in, the, in the year 2000 or even today. They don't literally look like this. But there's a more sinister truth about this picture. And that truth is that the beliefs about learning what learning meant, say, to Jean-Marc Cote, in many ways, in that moment of history continues to pervade much of schooling today. That learning is passive. That learning is transmission-based. That learning is about getting the knowledge that's selected, in this case by an old white man, as efficiently into the heads of students as possible. It's not active. It's kind of just happening in the heads of students. So there's some beliefs about learning that kind of are of that time. And it's important to remember this because as we try to shift and change and transform and innovate, historically, the beliefs about learning were largely set and set in motion a number of social relational practices, lines of authority and power back in the mid 1800s. These ideas that learning was passive and transmission based and individual and isolating and non active, all of these beliefs were founded before the discipline of psychology had become a domain and a field. And yet we created schools and classes and pedagogical practices before we knew a lot about learning. And so for many of us who continue to nudge and understand how change can happen at a scale 
in schooling, we bump into these beliefs. Now, that's not to say learning doesn't have parts that are transmissive, getting information. That's not to say there aren't parts of learning that are individual. Sure, there are. But we know a lot more about the essence of learning based on cognitive psychology and social psychology. And we should remember those as we're looking to the future, as we're thinking about the kinds of changes, because those beliefs will generate practices and they'll generate settings. Because what we're looking at here as an image calls into question aspects of learning, such as what do we learn? Where does learning happen? And how does learning happen? So these fundamental questions, in my experience at Project Zero, are important for us all to continually revisit because they're the fuel for the future. Let me say a brief note, too, before we move off of this image. Many people look at this image and they also notice that in the year of 1899, Jean-Marc Cote's picture only includes white men. It's important because the idea of inclusive education, public education, was in its infancy. So we could ask other questions of who is education and learning for? So let's shift now. And I'd like to spend the remainder of the time recapping some big transformations around the conception of learning that serve as a foundation for our conversation today, hopefully conversations we can continue to have, and the talk that I'll be following up on in a few weeks. Over, say, since the time of Jean-Marc Cote, there have been a number of transformations and innovations rooted in research, social science, cognitive psychology. I want to shine a light on four of those, because I think they give us some ideas about what learning could be. And they also give us some frames to understand why some innovations seem to really take hold. Learning as complex, learning as visible, learning as social, and learning as informal. Each of these I'll explain a little bit, but I wanna just remind us that these are radically different conceptions of learning than what was in that image from Jean-Marc Cote, and they're different conceptions of learning than many of the beliefs of learning that set in motion much of the organization of schools historically. So we should be very explicit if we're, if we're designing something around different beliefs, because we're going to bump into the social, historical, cultural roots of schooling and teaching and of learning. So let's take each one just briskly, and hopefully some of these will be a reminder for many of you this webinar. Learning is complex. What do we mean by learning is complex? Well, we can thank this gentleman in the upper left-hand corner for this. Historically, there are many traces and roots to this idea of learning as complex. This is Jean Piaget. Some of you might uh, recognize his face. And what Piaget, among other things, contributed to the learning sciences is that learning is an emergent phenomenon. Let's just imagine that for a moment. It emerges from the interactions we have with one's environment. And more importantly, while there might be some general properties, folks who followed in Piaget's footsteps have noted that it's largely unpredictable in its specifics. It's almost a unique phenomena within each human being. So when I say learning is complex, what I mean here is that learning in a scientific way 
is complex, like complexity science. It's emergent, it's unpredictable, and it relies on the conditions we create, both internal and external conditions. So if we think of that image of Jean-Marc Cote, learning is not complex at all. Learning is fairly simple. You pick the content, you get it in the heads, the students, as efficiently as possible. There is no complexity there. It is predictable. But what we know is that learning is not predictable. We'd like to think we can control it. But I'd like to invite us to consider that the best we can do as educators is create the conditions for learning to emerge. That's what Piaget would invite us to consider. So if we have a belief of learning is complex, we can ask ourselves, well, what are the practices, the pedagogical practices that are built on this belief? Well, here's an image of one that I think is quite striking. This is an image from the uh, Diana School in Reggio Emilia, Italy. Some of you might know of the Reggio Emilia uh, schools in Northern Italy. If you don't, they're worth an afternoon of reading about. It's in the small Northern town of Italy. Um, it's in, they designed a pedagogy in response to World War II that would be a pedagogy in which young children and the community would be engaged in democratic forms of learning. And part of what that pedagogy offers are practices. And one of those practices is a practice of documentation. And a documentation practice is closely paying attention to the learning process and instigating or provoking learning and watching it emerge. And so the children, the adults, and oftentimes many of the community members are engaged in this almost anthropological activity of documenting learning and interpreting learning and seeing how learning emerges. And that's a practice that reflects the belief that it, learning is emergent. We can't control it. The best we can do is create the conditions to put it in a bolder frame. Learning is not a standardized process. Okay, that's learning is complex. Let's move to learning is visible. And this is something I'm going to pick up on and go into more depth in, in the talk in a few weeks. For this concept, we can thank, among others, um, a psychologist named Margaret Washburn, who in the early um, 20th century was one of the first to create a theory that thinking and learning is not an internal only process, that as we learn and as we think, we externalize our thinking and learning through objects and artifacts in the world. So those objects and artifacts we create and we generate not only reflect the learning, but they're inherently connected to our, cog our cognition our thinking, our learning, our ways of knowing. So things like language, she would point to, that's an externalized artifact that is inherently linked to how we know. So visible, the idea of visibility is on the findings of Margaret Washburn and others who coined this notion of the externalization cognition. And there are many practices which dig into this. But again, let it, let's remind ourselves, this is radically different than the conception of the Jean-Marc Cote image, that learning is an invisible process that's simply happening you know, in a black box. Some practices you might know, there's Project Zero has a number of practices which, which have been developed around visible thinking, making thinking visible, making learning visible. I'll talk more about those. Um, in a few weeks, and, the, and not only what it does to support learning, but what it does to support other kinds of psychological states like motivation and engagement. But there are a number of other practices too. Uh, I'd like to share an image of a classroom nearby outside of Boston. This is an image from a college called Olin College. 
And one of the pedagogical practices that they adopt at this college is design thinking. And some of you might have been experimenting with design thinking over the years. It's a pedagogy and an approach that is based on the belief of thinking and learning is visible, that it is about externalization. And so you can see here students externalizing through whiteboards and sticky notes and lots of other artifacts. Visibility at its core reflects that belief. And so we can design settings, you know, lots of room and lots of artifacts and materials that would support the pedagogy and support the belief. Okay, learning is complex, learning is visible. Let's talk about the last two here. Again, just briefly. Now, learning is social. I would bet that this is the least controversial on the list here. Many of us, I'm sure, use groups and teams in our classrooms, have experimented with collaborative forms of collaborative learning and cooperative learning. But let's you know, meditate on this. You know, learning is social is a very direct response to the beliefs that were forming in the mid 1800s, in which learning was simply an individual pursuit. We can thank Lev Vygotsky, pictured here, and others who began to theorize that if we look at human development, the mediated relationship of others is critical. That is, as we learn language, as we learn work skills, vocations, as we learn content, we're mediating through the social relationships of others. And so more recently, there's many theories called communities of practice and others which operationalize this belief that learning is social. And we can see this belief in lots of ways and lots of practices. One of my favorite images I'll share here, and this is an image from the University of Iowa. And this is a lecture hall, which is designed for about, you know, four or 500 students. Can you notice something interestingly different about this lecture hall? Look closely. The seats turn. It's kind of a nuanced and subtle design intervention. But here we are looking at a setting that traditionally is designed for transmission, but with a small tweak and adjustment, it gives affordances and supports social interaction. Now, look, that's not to say you can't design for social interactions in a traditional lecture hall. I certainly have, and many of you have, I'm sure, too. But here's an example where the setting is intentionally designed around a belief that learning should be social, there should be interactions, and it can nudge or support different kinds of practices. OK, learning is complex. Learning is visible. Learning is social. Let's talk about one last transformation, which is in direct response to Jean-Marc Cote. Learning is informal. Let me apologize if you can hear some hammering in the background. They're working on the office next to me. Oh, wait, here's another example of learning as social. I'm sorry, I forgot I included this. We can see outside of physical spaces, interesting innovations, designs that adhere to the belief that learning is social in the digital realm. This is an example of a research project here at Project Sierra, but there's lots of other examples of online communities in which students gather, they're sharing stories, they're sharing information, they're interacting with one another. This particular project called Out of Eden Learn supports cross-cultural learning. They have over 60,000 students all over the world interacting about their communities and their values and their beliefs. It's not a transmission-based digital platform. That's not the idea. It's the opposite of what we might call a MOOC, which is a new kind of format, but an old conception of learning. It's about transmission. <laughs> so this one is, well, look, let's use technologies around a belief that is backed by contemporary conceptions of learning. Okay, 
to the last. Learning is informal. So this is, um, we can credit among other folks, uh, John Dewey with this kind of sparking this uh, refutation that learning is just formal. And what is formal learning? Well, there's been a number of researchers over the last, you know, 30, 40 years, which have consolidated a view of how we can distinguish between formal and informal learning. And formal learning is when the content, the process, and the evaluation is externally directed from the learner. So the learner's not setting goals. The learner's not designing the, the steps in the process. The learner's not involved or leading the assessments or evaluations of success or progress. So that's kind of classic formal learning. Informal learning draws on conceptions that John Dewey and others wrote about inquiry, about human inquiry. How is it that we as a species engage in learning? And what he and others set in motion was that, look, much of how we develop as human beings is when we set the goals, when we as learners design and are leading the process, and when we as learners are involved in designing and rendering evaluations and assessments of our learning. Now, obviously there's lots of in-between. It's not just, it's rarely just formal and rarely just informal. There can be blends of this. And in fact, good teachers do this all the time. I'm sure many of you do this in your classrooms where you might have some goals and a process, um, but you involve students in the evaluation. Or maybe you involve the students in co-creating goals or designing their own process. So there's ways we can run the two. But informal learning over the last, say, two or three decades has been picked up by many social psychologists and has been explored. And some of the claims are quite bold. Claims based on research suggest that most of what we come to know in vocations and in professions is through our informal learning experiences, not our formal learning experiences. So that's sad news for universities and colleges and schools, frankly, um, but good news for those of us who are designing informal learning professionally, say within a school. So thinking about ways in which people are learning with and from one another in the everyday work life. There are schools that have taken practices um, and explored ways to design settings that would support informal learning. This is an image from a school right across the street from where I live. It's called the Martin Luther King School. In it, there are lots of undesignated spaces where students can convene, share and lead one another in topics or ideas that they are interested in, not the teachers. So there's a lot of emphasis on student choice, empowerment so students can design their learning processes, and power given to students to evaluate and assess their learning over time. There are other school systems and networks um, that have also founded pedagogies and practices around this. The big picture schools, for example, is a global network of schools which have really cemented a number of practices around it. Okay, let's step back here and offer some closing remarks before some questions. This talk has essentially asked us to pause, pause before we act too quickly and, and grasp onto what we think will be innovative ideas and transformations out of the pandemic. And it's asking us to pause to consider what do we mean by learning and will these innovations and transformations be coherently connected to conceptions, contemporary conceptions of learning. That learning is not simple, that learning is not invisible, that learning is not just formal and individual. No, that learning is complex. It emerges through conditions. You can't control it. That learning is visible. It's being externalized. And we need artifacts and objects that represent and are tied to 
our knowing process. Learning is social, not just you know, with peers in a classroom, but if anything we've learned from the pandemic is that through technologies, we now have access to socialize in many interesting ways with communities around the world. And that learning is informal. And again, if we look at say, many of the technologies and digital platforms that students and youth and adolescents are engaged in, they are driving their goals and processes. So what would it look like to organize more of the schooling around these four? And I think that's a courageous question to ask. And it's a set of big questions to ask, but they're necessary questions. Because where, in my experience, in the experience we have here, many, many projects at Project Zero, where innovation tends to fall apart is when there's not alignment between the beliefs about learning, the practices we have in classrooms, and the context or the environments in which we're in which those practices take place. So if we have a belief that learning is just individual and passive, and yet we ask one another to engage in active learning, and we create settings for active learning, it will likely fail because our guiding beliefs are inconsistent with the practice and the context. But if we have beliefs about learning, that learning is social and learning is visible, and then we have practices that we develop around those beliefs, and we have settings that give those affordances, the tools, that alignment is in place, and we tend to see the transformations in the innovations take hold. It's not easy, and rarely do we see this alignment in simple ways, but when we see misalignment, it means we have to focus in on either designing contexts, emphasizing the practices, or really take the time and surface those assumptions and beliefs before we start moving too quickly into new practices and contexts. I hope some of the ideas here sound familiar to you. I hope some of the ideas were a little unsettling and challenging. At most, I hope the ideas open up some conversations we can have in the 15 or so minutes we have together, but also conversations we can continue to the next talk in a few weeks, in which I'll focus in on the visible component of learning and share some of the lessons we've had at Project Zero around visible learning and offer some of, I think, what are the unique attributes of visible learning, particularly when we're facing questions of engagement, motivation, and frankly, burnout. How can we, how can these ped pedagogies, particularly visible learning pedagogies, not be experienced as yet another thing we have to do? No, no, no. They can be experienced this way to actually re-engage one another in what we hope to be deep and powerful learning for our students. But let's not forget ourselves. We are learners. And the best learners are, sorry, the best teachers are very accomplished in learning. So with that, I'll leave you um, with the, those uh, ideas. Um, we, um, thank you so much for your attention. And um, I have not been tracking questions in chat, but feel free to offer questions in chat. And I'll turn it over to Edmundo, I believe, who will facilitate a Q&A period. And I'm going to listen uh, to the translation. Gracias, Edmundo. Muchas gracias, Daniel, eh, por esa presentación. Eh, igualmente, Reitero, digamos, la invitación, la intención es que podamos conectar a la comunidad escolar, en este caso junto con, con Daniel, así que quienes tengan preguntas pueden enviarlas a través eh, del chat y yo las voy a estar leyendo. Pero sí, yo quería entrar un poquito aprovechando este, este espacio. Justamente tú, tú hablaste al final, al final de el, o mencionaste más bien el burnout en, 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 en Latinoamérica y en Chile particularmente, la verdad que la situación es, es, es bien crítica y quien quienes nos acompañan seguramente eh, tienen incluso más información porque lo viven eh, directamente. Eh, 
Eh, ¿cómo, ¿Cómo podemos, eh, o de qué manera, en el fondo, el aprendizaje visible también, fuera de como considerarse algo más, que, que una tarea más que tengo que aplicar, o una metodología más que tengo que aplicar, en el caso que no lo estemos aplicando, eh, ¿cómo, ¿cómo aporta, eh, en el fondo, a evitar eh, que las personas sientan, o sea, mejoren los aprendizajes de los estudiantes y faciliten el trabajo del profesor? Quiero entrar como un poquito más en eso, haciéndome cargo, en el fondo, del, del concepto de burnout, que es una situación que estamos viviendo muy gravemente hoy día. It's a great, it's a really important question. And we should remember too that the feelings of overwhelm, the feelings of disengagement um, are not just with our, us as educators. Our learners likely feel the same way and the families too. So we, we can seek solidarity here. Um, we're not alone. And I would want to remind us that um, Chile is not alone <laughs> and Latin America is not alone. We have research projects all over the world. I was just talking with folks last night with, on some research projects in Australia. And Australia's, you know, they're having a massive resurgence with this new variant of COVID. And the burnout is real. I mean, teachers are having a hard time showing up I mean, physically showing up, but mentally showing up. What I took from Martine's comments earlier, I, 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 I don't want to forget. And that is, we don't want to push and pressure ourselves more. If anything, we should be carving out spaces to pause and to learn and frankly, reconnect. Without reconnecting with, to, with ourselves, our family, you know, with our learners, with our colleagues, I think we're going to have a hard time rising to what's necessary to ameliorate burnout. I mean, at its core, psychologically, burnout is experienced through a loss of control. I mean, much of professional burnout happens because, you know, we feel we are not in control and thus we have to withdraw. So the question is, if we're trying to ameliorate that, to mitigate that withdrawal, what do we do? How do we re-engage? We should not adopt strategies that add more pressure stress, and anxiety. That is not the way that will increase social withdrawal. Instead, we should think about how can we reconnect socially? How can we reconnect professionally? Like, what's our identity? Who are we now as teachers? What does it mean to teach now? And how can we reconnect to our values So it's almost like a moral reconnection. We can take a lot of lessons from healthcare, and doctors, and nurses, not just recently, but historically. It's one of those fields that has a lot of burnout. And so they think quite a bit about what professional development looks like, and they draw on these kinds of ideas. We need to reconnect sort of morally, through purpose, socially, through relationships, and professionally. So I think we should focus on that. Physical learning and there are other pedagogies ask us to slow down, not speed up. Slow down and they give us as educators the control about what are we interested in? What are the questions we have? And how can we create processes for our own learning And they invite in the reconnected tissue with our colleagues and with our students. I will say more about this, Edmundo, in, in, in the next talk, but it and other kinds of pedagogies that ask us to slow down, to think about you know, what are our moral purposes and goals, and to recreate the relational structures with our students, 
I think those are the ways that I see schools and educators kind of rebounding from a lot of the stress. Muchas gracias, eh, Daniel, por esa respuesta. No, están llegando ahora, sí, las preguntas. Mira, Claudio Valle pregunta lo siguiente. ¿Hacer el aprendizaje visible se puede hacer en todos los niveles de la educación? Y, eh, os, se, lo, se adapta a todo tipo de, y si se adapta a todo tipo de aprendices y adicionalmente si tienes alguna eh, bibliografía que recomiendes también um, yeah and I will certainly share more and I will share these slides but I mean the concept on which visible learning is designed is uh, well is connected to these kind of transformations I, I laid out. I mean, the idea of externalization and the notion that learning and thinking is visible, I mean, that's not a new idea. I mean, it's been around for a while. So that concept is not age specific. It's about how we develop as human beings. So the theoretical basis is the ages are irrelevant. What it looks like is going to be different in the ages. So, for example, I shared two images in today's talk. One was from the infant toddler centers at Reggio Emilia. So they work with, you know, infants, you know, ages six months up to toddlers, up to four to five years. So that's very early ages, and they have an approach which would be it is making learning visible. And in you know, the books that we have created. Um, have been with colleagues in Reggio Emilia, but also with colleagues who've taken those ideas and extended them in the K through 12 um, arena. But we can see it in other, you know, higher age levels too. The image I shared of Olin College is another practice. It's design thinking as a pedagogy. Um, it is visible. I mean, it, it attends to that visible. It's a different kind of pedagogy, um, but we see this with adults college students, et cetera. And there are many, many professions um, that use the notion of visible learning as kind of a precept. So in architecture and design, you know, these kinds of pursuits, they tend to use approaches that are much more about documentation and collaborative learning. I hope that that helps, but yes, not age specific and not domain specific. Muchas gracias, Daniel. Hay otra pregunta de Consuelo Sánchez. Dice, ¿nos puedes dar algunos tips o algunas recomendaciones para impulsar la transformación educativa en las comunidades educativas que siguen muy apegadas a la antigua pedagogía? ¿Cómo es que cambiamos este, esta visión? Sí, yeah, well, great question. If I had tips or advice, I think I would, you know, I... I, I But let, let me let me think. One of the classic mistakes I think we make in a traditional environment is to assume that everyone is doing the same thing. And I found that not to be the case. Even in very, very traditional schools, there are teachers. I mean, I, I'm a formal middle school and high school mathematics teacher. I, and I suspect many of you on, in this webinar, have done things that you wanted to do despite what the school is telling you to do. So one thing to ask is if you are, are interpreting a school or a context as traditional, is to ask oneself, well, where is the untraditional happening right now? And to look for it. And to see if there's some teachers and educators that actually have figured out a way to, to use an expression in English, hack the system. Hacking means to kind of deconstruct and figure out solutions. We as educators are really good at hacking things. <laughs> We find ways around things, I think, quite, quite well. So, you know, Looking for, in any given context, we want to look for, do we see some interesting forms that exist already, even if, even if they're few, but the fact that they exist, maybe with one teacher, or maybe with a, a group of teachers in a school, they, they've figured something out that's kind of innovative and interesting, 
The fact that it exists in the environment is good news. Because if we take an ecological view, it exists in the environment. There's some species, there's some organism that has actually found a way to survive. And that's interesting to know. Because now what we can do as designers is try to understand the conditions that allowed for that interesting practice to emerge, even at a small scale, and look for ways to, again, to borrow a word used in ecological sciences, to amplify that organism. It has a niche, we want to amplify it. So let's not pretend that everyone is doing the same thing, even in a traditional environment, and understand the variation. Typically, where we make mistakes, and when I say we, I mean me too, the mistakes we make is when we try to design for sameness. We want everyone to do the same thing. That would work in a very standard and traditional approach, like say in 1899. But what we know is that even when we try to do that, variation could happen, and it will happen. So going a little below the surface, and understanding what does variation look like would be my advice, and then try to find ways to amplify it, but don't pretend that everyone will uniformly do the same thing. Even in the non-traditional schools that many of you might work in, there's huge variation what, of what kind of teaching and learning looks like. So trying to understand what's, what are the different spectrums and how to move the system would be my advice. Actually, let me end with a second piece of advice. If we have belief systems that are different from the aspirations that we're seeking, we have to engage in lived experiences of what learning looks and feels like with, that new, with a new belief system. We have to surface those beliefs and engage in experiences. So professional development needs to be very experiential, very experiential. We cannot, you cannot ask me to teach project-based learning if A, I think learning is individual, but B, I've never experienced that. I don't know what it feels like. We have to, as teachers, understand what learning looks and feels like in order to embody that with our students. Daniel, estos espacios siempre se nos hacen extremadamente cortos. Hay hartas preguntas, pero estoy más que seguro que en el Congreso Internacional de Educación que vamos a estar desarrollando el 23 y el 24 de agosto, vamos a tener más espacio eh, para poder responderla. Yo quería agradecerte a ti por el espacio, por este tiempo que te diste, sabiendo que tu agenda es eh, bien apretada y el, y el tiempo también que te vas a dar y que te estás dando por trabajar en este congreso, para preparar este congreso en conjunto eh, con nosotros. Así que de repente unas últimas palabras y, 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 y nos vamos despidiendo. Muchas gracias, Daniel. No, muchas gracias a todos ustedes y yo espero, yo espero que podamos continuar la conversación, las conversaciones sobre aprendizaje visible o otros temas, porque yo creo que hoy en día es muy, muy importante que como educadores, como profesionales, necesitamos tener las discusiones sobre las metas, los procesos y los elementos que podamos usar no solamente para nos, nos, nosotros alumnos, para nosotros y los desarrollos de nosotros. So, muchísimas gracias al mundo, el ministerio y todos ustedes para su tiempo y atención hoy. Gracias, Daniel. También agradecer de mi parte y de parte de la Fundación Educacional Seminario al Centro de Innovación eh, del Ministerio de Educación, porque hicieron posible también ahí, Martín. Muchísimas gracias. Estoy más que seguro que este va a ser un espacio, es una instancia que inicia, digamos, una relación más a largo plazo. Esperemos que Así sea, gracias Martín, de verdad, eh, por todo el apoyo que nos entregaron. Y gracias a todas y todos quienes se conectaron. Estoy viendo caras conocidas, ¿eh? Héctor Aravena, entiendo que estás en el norte. Un abrazo, muchas gracias por, por acompañarnos tantas veces eh, en estos espacios. Eh, la, la Andrea Yankelevich, creo que también te conozco, Andrea. Un abrazo, muchas gracias. Y a todas y todos, eh, tantas caras conocidas, en verdad, vamos, 
José, José Órdenes, se me había olvidado, también te había visto, José. Muchas gracias, de verdad. Oigan, y lo último, una invitación para... Ahí, Melania, Melania Carrasco, un gusto conocerte tantas veces que nos hemos visto. Ganaste en unos concursos, imagínate, yo me acuerdo perfecto de ti, Melania. Qué gusto verte, de verdad. Eh, bueno, así vamos generando más comunidad entre nosotros, así que eh, la esperamos y la esperamos en otras instancias, pero de hecho, otro de los temas que Daniel hablaba y que, tenemos, que vamos a abordar mañana es cómo vinculamos, cómo estamos educando con las necesidades reales del mercado laboral. Eh, eh, es un tema, un tema soy muy interesante, muy, muy necesario por lo demás. Hoy día las la, la empresas tienen que innovar obligadamente y si no preparamos a nuestros estudiantes para adecuarse a estas necesidades reales de la empresa, realmente van a llegar final a, a un callejón sin salida. Se dice que el 40% de, lo, de los trabajos que existen hoy no van a existir al 2030. O sea, en Estamos a tan solo ocho, ocho, ocho años de eso, siete años y medio. Por lo tanto, tenemos que preparar a los estudiantes y las estudiantes para ajustarse a esas necesidades del mercado laboral. Y por eso mañana tenemos un seminario gratuito, es totalmente gratuito, en donde vamos a estar conociendo eh, algunas instituciones en las cuales eh, se desarrolla, digamos, educación fomentando esta, eh, esta adaptación de los estudiantes a las necesidades del mercado laboral. Esto es, insisto... Totalmente gratuito, es el, el seminario de, edu, de educación para el trabajo del futuro y ustedes se pueden inscribir a través de www.fundacionseminarium.com gratuitamente. Así que las y los esperamos en ese espacio que vamos a tener mañana desde las ocho y media de Santiago de Chile. Dicho esto, muchísimas gracias. Ahí está el foro para que se puedan inscribir al seminario de mañana que los esperamos. Eso, nos vemos en una próxima oportunidad. Un abrazo. Chau, chau.